call our meeting to order and um, take up S5 and we'll do a walk through with our legislative council, Ellen Tchaikovsky. Hello. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Ellen Tchaikovsky, Office of Legislative Council. Today I am here on S5. So on your website today is draft 1.1 of a strike all amendment. Uh, so you haven't done full markup yet in this committee, but last over the last week or so you have received multiple um, pieces of proposed amendments. I have included in this document some of those proposed amendments for your consideration. The amendment includes the language from the Public Utility Commission, the recommendations from the Office of Racial Equity, and the Efficiency Vermont edit. Um, and again, these are proposals of amendments. They're, you don't have to keep them. Um, and so they're highlighted in yellow, the changes. Uh, but we haven't done a full markup, so I didn't know if you wanted me to start at the top or if you want me to jump to the edits. Um, that's a great question because uh, I think I have some questions along the way in the bill, but maybe um, we can start and looking. What is it? Uh, do you remember? Let, let's start by going and looking at the edits. Okay. So the first edit is on page four. It's highlighted in yellow. And this is in section A122. Uh, so it's in section three of the bill, which is the statutory provisions. And this is a, the exact text of this was not, so, all right, so on page four, line one, the, the Public Utility Commission proposed changing the word uh, may to shall and making the default delivery agent the default in how credits are obtained by the obligated parties. Um, and so, so that's the first part. And so then I reconfigured the language slightly in response to that for readability. So on page four, this is the section of the bill that lays out the sort of primary elements of the program. So on page four, line one, an obligated party shall obtain the required amount of clean heat credits through the delivery of eligible clean heat measures by a, des a designated statewide default delivery agent unless the obligated party receives prior approval from the commission. So the language that's struck out on this page were the other three options. Um, and so I have moved the language from that to the default delivery agent section farther in the bill so that um, it is more clear later that if if this is the, the amendment you want to make, this is a, a clear statement that the default is going to the default delivery agent and that if an uh, obligated party wants to do something else, they have to get approval from the PUC and that's where it lists the other options of going to the credit market or doing the work themselves, or hiring a contractor to do the work. So I thought for the sake of readability, that would be later where there's that approval language. Just uh, when you were reading this on line three, mm -hmm. at the beginning you said default delivery agent, but it doesn't actually have to go with default there. So. Oh, you're right. Um, so it, it says designated way? statewide delivery agent. So it, it, it's without, it would be without the word default? Is that the correct, I'm just trying to see which is the... So um, I believe later in the, so on, page, on the next page it's defined as default delivery okay. agent. Um, in, in H715 we went back and forth on what the designated delivery agent or does it so that may be a holdover so yeah I can insert the word default there. I, uh, I, I'm just trying to be clear which way it is it doesn't I'm, I'm not saying it needs to be in there but the, you, the way you read it it, it was. Sure. So. Do you think it needs to be in there? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 
I think it's the de- that's the defined term. So the so aside from the grammar of this section, I think that this is a this is a this is a pretty substantial change that the PUC is proposing. Um, the the way that it came over from the Senate was sort of moving towards this language of the default being the default, if we will. Um, this is pretty. This is strengthening that, and I I think that that is definitely a policy choice on how much focus you want to be on the default delivery agent. Um, I think that it makes sense. The PUC explained their logic of why they think that would be logical. I think uh, a big picture idea that you should consider, and I am not an economics person, but originally the default delivery agent was supposed to act in some way similar to the non-compliance payment under the RES. Um, as it would be the option that allowed there to be a set price that was known, it would, and it would be the option to go there. Otherwise, um, obligated parties could go find credits potentially cheaper on the credit market, with the price of the DDA being potentially the most expensive. If you shift to the default being the default delivery agent, and then therefore they have to pay that credit price, I don't know what that does to the credit market, and maybe it does nothing, um, but you may want to think about that. So some of the things that I'm hearing around this, so I heard the PUC say uh, they wanted to have this shall because it would be easier for enforcement. And enforcement is something that the fuel dealers actually have raised for us. Um, the other concern that I'm hearing on the flip side is um, potentially around uh, if if we move to this shall, this is going to then require obligated parties to present a plan to the PUC as opposed to just go and do stuff. Yeah. So. <clears throat> um, and that may be the. A, a better policy choice, um, but I do want you to consider that. Um, and it will provide a bit more certainty. Again, another positive aspect is that there would be certainty for everyone. The, pre the DDA credit price would be known in advance, um, but then they would have to make a decision up front about if they're going to they're gonna do the DDA credit price or they have a plan to get the credits another way. So there would be certainty in that model. Um, I just don't know if it changes the economics at all. I mean, it doesn't seem like it would change the economics. It seems like, um, and and I don't, I, I guess my concern would be, does it limit the opportunities for the obligated parties um, by shifting to this? And my sense is it does not. Um, it adds a level of, well, we're going to tell you what we're going to do, but... Uh, I think practically it doesn't because the options are still there, but the PUC wants to know up front who is going to be taking advantage of the default delivery agent's services so that they can budget for all of that. So I don't think it's technically limiting their options um, and it's providing more certainty and more data up front so the DDA can do their budget planning. Um, okay, thank you. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Given that uh, part of this relates to the other parts of the DDA, can, can we like go through all the changes and, and then come back to discuss? Because mm -hmm. what I think about this relates to how it plays into other elements of the DDA. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sure. So the next change is on page five. And this was also a change proposed by the Public Utility Commission. On page five in the definition of low in customer with low income, which is definition number five, um, a new phrase is added at the end, and so it reads, customer with low income means a customer with a household income of up to 60% of area median income as published annually by the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, or a customer who qualifies for a government-sponsored low income energy subsidy. 
And so, as the PUC did point out, this language exists elsewhere in the in the bill, um, but it's adding it to the definition here. So, uh, does this serve to expand the number of people who would qualify or contract? Or um, I think potentially it doesn't do either. It just makes clear um, that if someone already qualifies for another program, there doesn't need to be necessarily income verification. I see. Okay. Yeah. It's sort of an automatic qualification um, statement. So the next change is on page seven. And this uh, was proposed, I think, primarily by the Office of Racial Equity, but uh, seconded by uh, the Public Utility Commission. So it's striking um, the sentence, the, the phrase here on page seven. Um, so starting on line eight, annual requirements shall be expressed as a percent of each obligated party's contribution to the thermal sector's life cycle CO2E emissions in the previous year. The annual percentage reduction shall be the same for all, all obligated parties. To ensure understanding among the obligated parties, the commission shall provide shall publicly provide a description of the annual requirements in plain terms. Um, and so the words with translation services available has been struck. Um, in the Senate, the, uh, the Office of Racial Equity were some of the last people to testify, and so they had recommended adding translation services, that phrase, um, in a few different places, and I think this actually may have been a error on my part of where, where specifically they were recommending it be added. And so I have moved this phrase actually to the end in the public engagement section. <coughs> So the next change is on page eight. There are two changes here. So at the top of page eight, subsection four, the commission may temporarily, for a period not to exceed 36 months, adjust the annual requirements <coughs> for good cause after notice and opportunity for public process. Um, in the bill as came over from the Senate, it was 18 months. So this is raising it to three years. This came from the PUC. Um, and I think Efficiency Vermont also agreed. Um, and there is another change in this paragraph. So good cause may include a shortage of clean heat credits, market conditions as identified by the department's potential study conducted pursuant to section 8125 of this title, or undue financial impacts on particular customers or demographic segments. And so the, that language was recommended by <coughs> Efficiency Vermont, I think, or the PUC. Yes, Efficiency Vermont recommended that. Uh, so the next change is on page nine, <coughs> subsection three. Line seven, beginning in 2024, each year on or before July 15th, the Department of Taxes shall annually provide to the commission a copy of the forms that were submitted between July 1 of the previous year and June 30 of the current year by the entities that pay the existing fuel tax established in 30 VSA, 33 VSA 2503A1 and 2. And these changes were recommended by the PUC. And I think you're going to hear more about the tax form stuff tomorrow. This was one of the changes. This was a change that the fuel dealers had asked for also. Moving from December to July. Is it here? No, it's not here. OK. That's right. That's right. Yeah, and so this is just clarifying the language that came over from the um, Senate already was requiring the Department of Tax to provide the forms. This is just adding by a date certain when they need to provide the forms. 
Um, and then again, related down on line 18, on or before July 1, 2023, the Department of Taxes shall ensure <clears throat> that the, d the fuel tax form required under 33 VSA 2503 includes a prominent notice <clears throat> explaining that the form will be made publicly available. So again, adding a date certain. So the next change is on page 12. Um, this is another um, small change that relates to a larger change that's discussed later in the bill. Um, so on page 12, subsection 4, with consideration to how to best serve customers with low income and moderate income, the commission shall have authority to change the percentages established in subdivision 2 and those are the percentages that require uh, credits specifically coming from low income customers and moderate income customers. So they have the authority to change the percentages for good cause. <clears throat> uh, and actually after should not be struck, sorry. After notice and opportunity for public process, good cause may include shortage of clean heat credits or undue adverse financial impacts on particular customers or demographic segments. So um, the f consultation with the equity advisory group is struck there um, because the Office of Racial Equity suggested getting rid of the equity advisory group in, and instead having a third party consultant uh, do specific public outreach related to the equity questions. So throughout this draft, I have struck the other references to the equity advisory group. So I don't know if you want to talk about this now or later when we get to the public engagement consultant section. So the next change is on page 16. Um, so on page 16, Uh, this is the section on the default delivery agent. So appointment. The default delivery agent shall be one or more statewide entities capable of providing a variety of clean heat measures. The commission shall designate the first default delivery agent on or before June 1, 2024. So this recommendation came out of Efficiency Vermont's testimony. They actually didn't pick a date um, in their testimony. They just identified um, setting a date for the first designation. Um, so June 1 is a placeholder. Uh, you may want to hear testimony on what date that should actually be. Um, but given that the work is going to start in July of this year, um, I went with June 1. However, that may be too late. Um, you may want to consider this morning, Efficiency Vermont mentioned February potentially, um, so you may want to hear testimony. But they didn't. I don't think they included a specific date as a recommendation. I mean, so will will it be helpful for us to consider this in light of the whole timeline, which I think we're going through tomorrow? Yes. Yeah, and so this date isn't on. The, so on the timeline that I did rough draft of, I, I put it roughly sometime in the spring of 2024. Um, so, but I I don't know, and I don't know if there's been any testimony on how long it's going to take to actually designate the default delivery agent. So you may want to hear more about how long the PUC thinks it will be take to actually appoint someone. Uh, alternatively, you don't need to include a deadline if you don't want one. So the next change is on page 17, and it's the one that I mentioned first about the default delivery agent. So on page 17, line 11, use of the default delivery agent. 
An obligated party shall meet its annual requirement through a designated default delivery agent appointed by the commission. However, the obligated party may be approved by the commission to meet its requirement in whole or in part through one or more of the following ways, by delivering eligible clean heat measures, contracting for delivery of eligible clean heat measures, or through the market purchase of clean heat credits. So originally this language um, with those three options was up at the front. I thought it made sense um, if you're going to accept the PUC suggestion that it made sense here in this paragraph. Uh, and so additionally, there's some uh, cleanup language in the next paragraph. So the commission shall provide a form for an obligated party to indicate how it intends to meet its requirement. The form shall require sufficient information to determine the nature of the credits that the default delivery agent will be responsible to deliver on behalf of the obligated party. If the commission approves of a plan for an obligated party to meet its obligation through a mechanism, other than payment to a designated default delivery agent, then the commission shall make such approvals known to the default delivery agent as soon as practicable. So down at the bottom of page 18, um, is a change that you have discussed again from the PUC, I believe. So um, the commission shall open a proceeding on or before July 1, 2023, and at least every three years thereafter. So adding at least. Um, and then it goes on to say, to establish the default delivery agent credit costs or costs and the quantity of credits to be generated for the subsequent three year period. Um, so that, this language at the top of page 19 about the quantity of credits, um, this was a suggestion by Efficiency Vermont. Um, I do think it makes sense. Um, I've, I have been wondering if the July 1, or if in the first um, budgeting cycle, when in the process they'll know how many credits will need to be generated. Um, but it doesn't actually give a deadline, so it's probably fine. Um, and then subsequently, I think it'll be easier to figure out, but that first one, the timing on these things may take a little while. Do you want to f follow up on what I just said? Could you say it again? <laughs> sure. So the first proceeding on establishing um, the default delivery agent and its budget um, the proceeding will start on July 1, 2023, but the default delivery agent won't be hired at that point. And also at in July of this year, we also won't know um, the realm of uh, emissions reductions that will need to be achieved. We won't know the exact number. Um, so at least in the first year, the quantity of credits to be generated won't be known until probably closer to 2026. Um, and I don't think that's necessarily setting a deadline here, but um, I just wanted to point that out, that the first, the first time they do this work, it's going to take a little time to figure out that math. Okay, so the next change is uh, on page 20, and it's in the rulemaking section. Um, and so this was again proposed by the PUC. So in subsection B, the requirements to adopt rules and any requirements regarding the need for legislative approval before any part of the Clean Heat Standard goes into effect do not in any way impair the Commission's authority to issue orders or take any other actions both before and after rules take effect to implement and enforce the Clean Heat Standard. <coughs> so this, um, this is a change from what the Senate sent you. Um, 
I do think that the Senate's check back language left sort of an open question about to what extent the PUC could do any work. And so this language is clarifying that, um, that they still have the authority to do um, some work, including issuing orders. Um, Um, the next page, the next change on this page is, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, just, just skipping over this um, somewhat quickly, or, and you did a good job explaining it, but if they do not need legislative approval before any part of the clean heat standard goes into effect, I thought we have, we have a guardrail number one that's coming back to us. This is just for the rules? So this is actually just for the orders. So it's, the lead-in language is a little awkward here. So the requirement to adopt rules and, and any requirements regarding the need for legislative approval do not in any way impair the PUC's authority to issue orders. So this is saying, notwithstanding the later notwithstanding clause, the PUC can issue orders on the clean heat standard. So, this is an open question. The PUC has asked for this because the checkback provision at the end would prevent them from issuing any orders. So they have proposed this. Do you want to them to be allowed to issue any orders before the checkback? And you could potentially be more specific if you'd like. This language is broad. If you'd like to specify what orders they would be allowed to issue, for example, if you'd only like them to be allowed to issue orders establishing the credit market or um, some of the orders around the forms that um, the obligated parties would need to be able to f need to fill out, if you want to give them some specific order authority, you could go be more specific on this. Thank you. Um, I guess in regards to this, I mean, so you mentioned some of the orders that they could possibly do or take other actions. I'm just looking for what 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 could they possibly issue orders about that would actually hurt our ability to, you know, be a, a check back, you know what I mean? Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yes, okay. I do. I do. I think that there have, um, there have been statements from the legislature, including from Senate Appropriations, who asked for the check back. Um, they don't want the clean heat standard itself to take effect until there's full legislative approval. Right. And so that. then the question is, does the PUC need to do any smaller parts of it, do they need authority to do any of that in the meantime? So I think the credit system is one of the things where that is, because there's early action credits allowed in here where people are allowed to, to um, gain credits earlier, um, that might be something you want to consider giving them authority to do because then people could start accruing credits um, if you never past the rules on the clean heat standard, then that would sort of, it would just be floating out in space. So maybe you don't want to do that, but um, that's a pretty discrete element of all this where there will need to be a third party consultant setting up a system of registration and verification of those. Um, uh, you may want to ask the PUC if there's any other, I, I was trying to think of other examples. Um, I was brainstorming some other examples of discrete other elements that they may want. Um, but the, the forms, I do think, is a, potentially another aspect. They want to register people and start getting a handle on the, the universe of entities we're talking about. So if they want to issue a, a an order, a procedural order on what the forms look like for the people to register, that might be one. Um, I guess we could talk about that. Would, would this include the default delivery agent section as well? So under the default delivery agent, they can either do an order of appointment or a contract of appointment. And so if you don't give them any order authority, I 
think they might have to go with a contract, which I don't know um, detail-wise the differences between that, um, but potentially, yes, if they wanted to do an order of appointment, I do think that could impact the default delivery agent. In fact, it does say an order of appointment on page 16. But doesn't it also say contract? Yep. Line five. Yeah. I had a question about twelve years in this section, but okay. Um, I don't know where the number come from. Sorry. Um, the, I think the PUC asked for that in the Senate. I don't know if it has a his. I don't know if there's precedent for that. Um, but that that was something they recommended was twelve years. Okay. Uh, uh, Pat. Yeah, I think I think I understand the need for them to give give orders, and I would say in general, without getting into specifics, it's so that that um, in the event the legislature does give approval to go ahead, they're ready to go. Um, and, and they have everything, they have things set up so that, that they can then proceed. If the legislature doesn't give approval, then you, you could say, well, that was, you know, that it was a wasted effort on their part. But, but we, if, we, if the legislature does give approval, we would want them to, to be ready, you know, to ready, ready to go. And so to set up requirements uh, uh, for uh, some of the uh, obligated parties, you know, things that they need to do or, or or to have a, a contract in place with an entity contingent on legislative approval means that they, you know, they could really get started if, if, if they were going to get started. But just general, without getting into, you know, what would the orders say, because we don't, we don't know that. But I think, I think I understand the need for it. So also on page 20 is a, is a just slightly different topic. Um, so subsection C, um, there is a request from the Office of Racial Equity. So uh, subsection C, the commission's rules may include a provision that allows the commission to revise its clean heat standard rules by order of commission without the revisions being subject to the rulemaking requirements of 3 VSA chapter 25, provided the commission provides notice of any proposed changes, allows for a 30 day comment period, responds to all comments received on a proposed change, provides a notice of language assistance services on all public outreach materials, and arranges for language assistance to be provided to members of the public as requested <coughs> using professional language service services <coughs> companies. So four and five were proposed by the Office of Racial Equity. So on page, the next change is on page 21. And here we're in eight, section 8127, which is regarding the clean heat credits. Um, so in subsection B, there's proposed language from Efficiency Vermont. Um, again, this is proposed language. Uh, so credit ownership, line 14. The commission in consultation with the technical advisory group shall establish a standard methodology for determining what parties, what party or parties shall be the owner of a clean heat credit upon its creation including a representative value for the provision of all components of current and future programs to include financial incentives, workforce development, and mar uh, market uplift and training. The owner or owners may transfer those credits to a third party or to an obligated party. So um, I haven't uh, talked to you about all this, so this is a proposal from them. Um, I find this to be an odd provision. Um, I think it's very interesting, this idea about using the credits to um, enhance and support workforce development, but I don't 
So first, I'm not sure that putting it in the credit ownership section makes sense. I was wondering if it should go maybe in the next section on how credits are valued, but I, I don't know how the math would be done to count workforce as part of a, a credit, and I'm wondering if they're envisioning a credit being divisionable or dividable, divisible, <laughs> based on the amount of workforce development. But I also, I don't know how that would be quantified. So yeah. I, I maybe would need more information on how you would quantify workforce development and market uplift in a credit denomination. So. Um, yeah, this, this is one of the um, things that I, I, I like the idea of trying to include workforce development, training, et cetera, into the credit system <clears throat> because then that provides resources to ensure that those activities are happening and recognized as, con as a contribution to the reduction of emissions. I think it's a good idea. Um, and also, I am not particularly concerned about how they figure out how to do it, since it's the, up to the PUC in consultation with the TAG to determine how that would work. But I also see your point that if it's stated in the ownership section, might this also need to be addressed in the values section or one or both. Yeah, because I, I wasn't sure if they were suggesting that they get their own credit in addition to the installation credit or if it was dividing the credit that's given for a measure. So I maybe have follow-up questions, just, but. Yeah, I think that this adds a level of complexity here that is not going to be helpful. I think we should try and take care of the workforce issues. Yeah, separately. I was wondering, because Dave also had mentioned um, Tier 3, is it kind of a similar thing where there's different actors? There's the electric utilities <coughs> who have Tier 3 credits they want to get. Um, and this is kind of talking about the upstream work of someone like EBT in doing workforce development and training. Um, is it related? Is that a related question about how these different actors would... So my... I think the only thing I'm aware of with Tier 3 is that there were issues initially when uh, tier three credits were getting sorted out about who got credits when combining incentives from multiple agencies. And so um, I do think in tier three, um, credits uh, are divided if there are shared um, incentives provided by multiple agencies so that, uh, so it's slightly different. Um, I don't know if they've done anything else beyond that because I, but you potentially could hear more about some of the other issues they looked at when they were developing the tier three system. Representative Pat and Stevens. The tier three system for the electric utilities, that's a case where two different entities like the utility and efficiency of Vermont are both contributing to the installation of certain efficiency. Right. So you can actually measure what what the, um, uh, the the effect of the efficiency measure is. And then you say, well, uh, if it was paid for 50-50, then each entity gets credit for that. But but the, the point I'm making is that you you actually can measure this uh, measure um, uh, has this effect and with training, uh, you know, making uh, training competent employees to do this work doesn't measure what the greenhouse gas emissions reductions are, even though we all understand that we need to do it. So I think that's why this sounds complicated to me. Um, yeah, I think that's all I have. Thank you. 
You had mentioned that maybe there was another way to capture this or uh, another location to try and put this for. <clears throat> well, so I was thinking, so on the next page, there's um, subsection C lists a couple of ways that credit values are counted. Um, and so it's not specifically on point, um, but if we're talking about dividing a credit, I thought maybe it might go there um, as opposed to the ownership, although maybe it doesn't make a huge difference, but I was, if, if you're thinking about, if the thinking on this language was related to how to quantify um, elements beyond greenhouse gas emissions, maybe that should be addressed under the section where they talk about how credit values are established. But this is like sort of really deep in the weeds on what the process is gonna be. And maybe maybe I'm overreading it just because I hadn't really thought about doing this before. I haven't, I'm not really familiar with this concept, but. It seems like we should agree whether we want to hear or not for one person. Vice Chair, Rep uh, Representative Sevilla, be less enthusiastic about it. Um, Representative Logan. Thanks. Um, yeah, I, I think about this as someone who works in um, social services administration, um, somewhat similar to the kind of calculation you would do on a grant to include all of the material resources that are necessary for the administration of, and, and it's kind of novel to actually think about packaging that in climate work, um, the services provided, um, the installation services, yes, you can measure the, the amount of emissions that are reduced, and then you also have overhead, things like workforce development training, et cetera, that are required for the business to be able to install the clean heat measure. Um, yeah, I, I think where I'm at is, I don't know that it goes in credit ownership, um, but I, I do think it, there should be, I, I would like to remain open to where it could fit to be captured as an area that is going to take effort and investment, and then therefore should be recognized in some way. But I, it doesn't seem right here. Why don't we ask Ellen to think about where she thinks it should go, and then it will give all of us time to think about whether we want to include it. Representative Morris. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, uh, listening to Representative uh, Sebelier, I it also, the flag to me that if we're going to include the workforce development, a credit use for workforce development, that the have nots are going to be paying into a credit system for the ones that have the installation efforts and would be training their workforce. So the ones that have, that have nots or do nots that are going to install would be paying for the ones that do to train the workforce and perhaps would cut would cut some of the uh, incentives or the installations that we're trying to get into the low to medium income. So that, I would have that concern about using credits for workforce development, I think. But maybe, maybe I didn't, I got one head nod and yes and one questioning look, so I'm wondering. I understand. I understand. Uh, Representative Logan. I think the point is that, well, I'm not sure what you mean by have nots and- That don't do the installs. And oh. paying the credit, having to buy the credits oh. from those that have it. Right. Um, to satisfy the requirements on an annual basis. Um, right. Um, I mean, yes, if, if uh, I think the, I think the real question is really just what does it take to actually implement this program and should we include the, the operations of the, the installation business, for example, 
but is required to build up the workforce or do the work. Um, I think we should try it on in a different location and then that'll cost us time to think about it. Yeah. Um, yeah, because my other thought would maybe be in the DDA budget, but I'll think about that. Seems to me your first inclination um, under credits made sense. Credit values. Okay. <laughs> All right, so the next change is on page 22. Uh, so small change, uh, but potentially big impact. So on page 22, this was uh, suggested by the Office of Racial Equity. Down on line 16, list of eligible measures. Eligible clean heat measures delivered to or installed in Vermont may include, and there are a list of 11 uh measures so as it came over from the senate it was shall include uh the office of racial equity did present this in senate natural as well and senate natural wanted to stay with shall um so this is again just for your consideration um don't know thoughts well help us understand um so if it's shall does it limit it to these things no so, but shall, um, and so this is uh, the eligible measures that the TAG and the PUC shall look at and potentially award credits to is this list. The list can be more than this and potentially will grow over time. This is the baseline list that need to be reviewed for um, greenhouse gas emissions and uh, awarding credits for. Um, Changing it to May does not require that they review all 11 actions. Um, and so it's kind of a minor point. I think what Senate Natural discussed was, uh, I mean, I think one of the prime examples is green hydrogen. Um, I don't believe that there are currently any residential use of green hydrogen for heating. Um, and that is a newer technology. I don't know if and or when it would be available for residential use, um, but it is on the list for the tag to consider how many credits it could get. Um, they may find that the technology is not currently feasi uh, feasible or advisable for home use, and so they may award zero credits for someone seeking to install green hydrogen. Um, it's only looking at the supply of the biofuels and green hydrogen. And it's commercial industrial too, as, yeah. Yeah. So, um, Senate Natural was comfortable that if something wasn't, that something would be sort of ranked based on how many credits it could actually gain. And if it wasn't very efficient, it would get fewer credits than other things. So it would be less incentivized. Um, but changing it to May means that the tag doesn't necessarily have to consider all 11 on this list. Oh, right. Representative Sebelia. Yeah, so I think I would like to leave this um, as it was, we have um, um, something else I would say is that um, there's 11 items on this list in, I believe in H715, there were only seven. It was a shorter list. Um, and in, during the initial drafting of S5, there was concern that it wasn't clear if unnamed technologies would be included. And so the list was made broader to be more explicit. Um, you could default to a shorter list um, because it would allow the tag 
to take up other technologies sort of as ad hoc as they come up. Um, not having something on this list doesn't inherently preclude it from being considered. This is creating the baseline. Um, Representative Pat, and then Sacramento. So, so what's based on what you just said, if if um, if the language goes in um, <clears throat> the way it is here, uh, and three years from now there's a, a new technology that everyone agrees this you know this works, um, that doesn't preclude them from adding that. It just, it just it's so it's so what by adding may it it recognizes that there may be additional measures in the future beyond this list that would, um, that would is that what it's the same? Um, so I think either way, new technologies will be um, able to be considered. <clears throat> it, the question with may versus shall is whether or not you want everything on this list to be initially considered. Yeah, I think future wise, any other things that can be brought to the tag, but this is the the starting list of things to be considered. And potentially if there's things on this list you actually don't want to be initially considered, maybe you should just take them off the list. Representative Sackowitz. Wondering if this might be one of those cases where the, the problem is that it's a list yeah. and maybe we ought to be coming up with description of the kinds of things that we want rather than trying to enumerate them. Where does this come from, Gina? I believe this list has come from well, the advocates. year and a half of I was going to say. negotiations between the very, very diverse group of stakeholders that have been working on this behind the scenes. Because yeah. we, so we are trying to be technology neutral. So this seems by like putting it as a list is kind of at least implicitly making it not so neutral, right? We're saying these are the ones that we like. I don't know if, we're, if you're trying to be technology neutral that we were in terms of how we're getting clean heat, that we were measuring it according to a common standard and that how we get to that standard is up to the market. Yeah, this is not limiting. This is a starting place. Yeah, it's inclusive. Yeah. Representatives, uh, Logan. Thanks. Um, could we resolve this by saying something like shall um, but it's not limited to. Include I, does that. Good job. Yep. Um, Including includes, but not limited to. Um, yeah. Yeah. And uh, what, what was the impetus for the May? Do we know? Um, the Office of Racial Equity. Uh, yeah, you may want to look at their testimony. I think they said that they have concerns that not everything on the list is environmentally sound. Green hydrogen. Yeah. So um, May May would give you would give the PUC the ability to not include something on this list potentially. Okay. Representative Simmons. Um, ultimately, the tag is going to decide through their methodology, what is achieving, you know, reduced emissions. Um, and I guess I'm wondering if this is much of a muchness um, because it's, do you not know that, is that, I, I mean, essentially, you know, we're saying you must, hey tag, you must look at these 11 items and other items or we're saying you can look at these 11 items and other items. 
Exactly. Whatever you want to say it, Representative Simmons. Yeah, to the ask the question. Okay. You can turn your shirt off. You're saying anything. But they can look at anything they want to based on this language. It's just whether or not we're saying the first go around, you must look at this. Right. We can think about this one too. That's one more question. Sure. Uh, Colin. So this, all this work is done. Market is created. We come back to the legislature. It's two years. Green hydrogen is a nightmare. Can the legislature at that point say, uh, and no green hydrogen? In a bill, ideally. In a bill. Well, yes. 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 <laughs> I mean, you could say that, but we probably would want to amend this statute and strike green hydrogen at that point. I guess I was not aware that there was some other way to do it. Well, well that's all. I'm sorry. <laughs> I think that that conversation in two years will have a couple of dimensions, but because it will be in the statute. Yeah. With it's really just a matter of, do we want to require them to look at this entire list or are there things on there that we are prepared to eliminate right now? Right? Yes. Oh. All right. Moving on. So on page 27 uh, is another recommendation from the Office of Racial Equity. Um, and their testimony was that um, low and moderate income customers should not be required to disclose more information than other customers. Um, and so the language on, pa on page 27, line 14, adjusts that language. So this is still in the, the clean heat credit system, and this is the information needed to register a credit. So the system shall require entities to submit the following information to receive the credit the location of the clean heat measure, customer income amount, the type of property where the clean heat measure was, was installed or sold, type of clean heat measure, and other information. Um, and so previously it read whether the customer was low income and moderate income, uh, had a low income or moderate income. Um, and so I'd be interested to know if that language is sufficient. Um, I think there would be a couple different ways to accomplish this, but in some way, uh, income level will have to be known because of your interest in providing credits for those with low and moderate income. So some amount of, of income information will need to be known, um, but this at least requires it from everyone. Um, and it maybe doesn't need to be super specific. Perhaps it could just be which of the categories do you roughly fall into or something like that, but. So um, qualifications uh, requirements to be low income or moderate income are not my customary place of existing. So I'm wondering, are there other indicators rather than income that also go into that like number of people in your household? Yes. So that must be part of why that's, I need to call it out. Oh, sure. Okay. Right, like, and otherwise, we're not going to really know if we're meeting that mm -hmm. requirement. So somehow we need to okay. go a little beyond income, I think, Representative Sibelia. So uh, I just want to make sure I'm oriented to where we are. So uh, in order for a measure that is being installed uh, by an obligated party or the DDA uh, to receive credit, so you're installing a heat pump uh, and receiving credit for that. So there's some sort of uh, value that's transacting back and forth for the customer for the requirements, compliance requirements. In order for that to receive credit, you have to have the income. So it's not, you have to verify income. So make sure I'm, so, and that seems, um, it seems pretty, You're seeming something. 
in exchange for and it's you're not being required to give that information and you're receiving something yeah and so the way i've tried to draft it here to be neutral and vague and so it may not require exact income verification um because there have been concerns raised about I think for multiple parties, um, concerns raised about ex exactly requiring people to disclose their exact um, information, income information. But to get, since this bill does require credits come from customers who have low and moderate income, that will need to be determined at some stage. And so this is at the credit registration stage. Yeah, that's a good point. When should it be? I mean, that's when we're keeping track of it, right? So presumably someone would installing it would probably ask up front, but this is requiring it at the registration stage specifically. So you would, right. So if you haven't asked up front, you're not going to have the information here. So, I mean, I guess you'll have to ask up front. What would happen if you don't ask government? Uh, so here's a question for you. Customer income amount. And that, so what about customer income information as opposed to amount? Or range. So, I mean, information feels like it gives you more flexibility in terms of what could be provided or asked for. Representative Pat. Uh, I think the original language uh, protects uh, privacy more than the, the new language uh, uh, because um, because of the, the issue of you, you don't just need to know a dollar amount. Right. You need to know how many people in the household and, and, and maybe and other factors as, as well uh, that, that might affect that. I mean, I think elsewhere, uh, if, if the per, if, if the household um, is uh, eligible for and receiving a an, an, uh, government sponsored um, uh, subsidy. Uh, an energy subsidy. Uh, that in itself, no more information is needed. That in itself tells everybody the person the person's qualified. Um, so uh, um, I, I would I would I don't see what's wrong with the language as original. And I think if by saying customer income amount, you're actually saying we need to know uh, how many dollars. Everybody's income. Yeah. Uh, you're going to qualify. Yeah. Yeah. I, I prefer the original. You're right. I think so. Yeah. I think it is well taken. Okay, so the next change is on, starts on page 30 and goes into 31, and it is striking the clean equity, clean, the clean heat standard equity advisory, which again is a recommendation from the Office of Racial Equity. So the language is just struck there, and then new language is added to address this on page 35. So this is all struck. Um, and we should maybe come back to the change on page 33, but I, I don't know if you want to talk about the, the public engagement language on 35 first. Sure. So in response to getting rid of the equity advisory group on page 35, the facilitator, the public engagement facilitator language has been um, uh, increased. So, so this is in the public engagement section at the end of the bill. So the commission shall hire a third party consultant to design and conduct public engagement. The commission may use funds appropriate under this act on hiring the consultant. Public engagement shall be conducted by the facilitator for the purposes of, and this is most of the language that's being struck in the equity advisory group section. So for the purposes of supporting the commission in assessing whether customers will be equitably served by clean heat measures, and how to increase equity in the delivery of key measures, identifying actions needed to provide customers with low income and moderate income with better service and to mitigate the fuel price impacts calculated in 30 VSA 8128, recommending any additional programs, incentives, or funding needed to support customers for low income and moderate income, 
and organizations that provide social services to Vermonters in affording home heating fuel and other heating expenses, and providing information to the commission on the challenges renters face in equitably assessing clean heat measures and recommendations to ensure that renters have equitable access to clean heat measures. So that is most of the language that was in the equity advisory group previously. And so this is moving it to have a one-time public engagement process on these topics um, led by a, a public engagement facilitator. Um, and so my only additional thought is I am wondering if this level of public engagement may require some additional funds. Um. Was the shall changed at the top of page 35? Yes, it was previously a May. Oh. And so that's why I think there is some, so the money that's appropriate at the end of the bill to the PUC encompasses their, um, their new staff and then the facilitator costs as well as advertising for public engagement. Um, but I think this would contemplate, uh, and, and so that would cover six public meetings but I am wondering if this potentially may require additional public meetings potentially, or I'm not entirely sure what it would cost a facilitator to run this kind of public engagement. So that may require some additional funding, um, but I'm not entirely certain. Susanna Stemmons, um, is the reason why is there a reason why you changed it from the May to the shall? That was the recommendation from the office. Oh, okay, that was also awesome. yeah, right. especially because you're giving them a, a substantial more amount more of work here. Um, because previously it was May hire a consultant to design and engage and do public engagement, which may have been kind of a that might that seemed like it was a more sort of standard process potentially. This is a little more. Um, tailored to the clean heat standard. So I don't know if that would potentially involve maybe a different type of consultant. Representative Sibelia. No. no. Okay. Thank you. All right. Sorry, I'm to this conversation. Um, it, this is one of the reasons why I was looking at Act 154. We're going to strip out the equity advisory group and for reasons, good reasons that we heard, which were that it is a similar group of people, you know, being tasked on all of these equity advisory boards. Um, in order to provide a sufficient level of accountability for um, the facilitator, um, it does seem like we need some um, reference to the Environmental Justice Advisory Council or the Interagency Environmental Justice Committee. Um, who are tasked with guiding and coordinating state agency implementation of the environmental justice state policy, et cetera. Reference where? Here in this section on public engagement, since the environmental justice policy won't be implemented until 2026, um, I mean, ongoing, you know, every three years, then the, this policy would be implemented at, after 2026. But this is effectively removes all accountability of the facilitator to any state standards. Uh, basically says the facilitator's standards will be sufficient for determining whether or not the process has been equitable, but it does seem that the facilitator should be accountable to these groups that have been formed. I'm just not sure which. Representative Sibelius. So 
do you see in consultation with or after consulting with shell hire? Potentially, mm -hmm. but it ha I mean, it has to be an existing. How about that? That's the facilitator. Yeah, so the interagency committee, I think, just started meeting, and I don't know if the advisory council has been fully formed yet. Folks were supposed to be appointed to both groups on or before December 15th. Yeah, they, they were not. Um, they are starting to be appointed, and I think if some appointments have been made. I don't think they have all been made. I guess my concern here is that the Climate Council did all this work to develop guiding principles for a just transition and environmental justice advocates did all this work to develop these principles and there's just no, there's no link back. Yeah, there's no link back and no obligation of the facilitator to implement that vision. So my suggestion is that the first time that Ellen's heard it, so why don't we, um, and maybe you could work with her a little on that too, get some ideas out there for where it makes sense to include it. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm wondering if anyone, I don't know if you want to pose that question to the Office of Racial Equity, mm -hmm. since that was their suggestion, if maybe they want that. Um, I do know that the PUC has been participating in the interagency council. Um, so they are at least aware of the work that is starting to, but I think your point is well taken. Um, all have been appointed according to the speaker's office. Oh, good. Um, I, I'm happy to reach out to Jay at the, or, or Susanna at the office of, Racial equity and make sure that they're okay with a reference back to EJ policy. Okay. Thank we you. Should. We need to go back to page 33. And so the language on this, this <coughs> on page 33 is related to what we were discussing earlier. So this is the check back section. Um, and this was proposed by the PUC. And so the check back provision currently says the commission shall not file proposed rules to the Secretary of State, Secretary of State or issue any orders. And so that is struck implementing the clean heat standard. Um, so, uh, and that's in connection to the earlier piece of language about allowing them to issue orders. Representative The PUC is coming in tomorrow? Yes. Can we ask them for some clarification on this tomorrow? Yes. Okay. I think we are almost done. So on page 36, again, the reference um, to the equity advisory group has been struck in uh, paragraph one, in uh, subsection one, and in subsection four. And then in subsection two, the reference to translation services uh, is, is added back in because it was moved from the front. So the meeting shall be open to everyone. These are the, the meetings about developing the rules, including all stakeholders, members of the public, and all other potentially affected parties with translation services available to those attending. And then uh, related to that, on page 37, again, from the Office of Racial Equity um, Advertising, the PUC is supposed to um, use some of the funding on advertising the public meeting to get a wide variety of segments of the public. Uh, so new language is added on line three. All advertisements of public meetings shall include a notice of language assistance services. The commission shall arrange for a language assistance to be provided to members of the public as requested using the services of professional language services companies. Language services companies. Uh, and then on page 38, 
uh, this is a change from the public utility commission. So um, this is in the rulemaking section. And so part of the APA is being waived in this rulemaking section because of the fact that the rules are gonna come before the full general assembly. So in uh, subsection four, they've added this language, um, I think just clarifying what was already there, but once adopted and effective, any amendments to the rules implementing the clean heat standard shall be made in accordance with the APA unless the adopted rules allow for amendments through a different process in accordance with 30 VSA 8126 C and D. So again, that's their order authority. Um, and then finally on line 19, uh, this was also proposed by the PUC. Um, so on or before February 15, 2024, the commission shall report to the General Assembly on suggested revenue streams that may be used or created. Um, and previously it was January 15, 2024. So bumping it out an extra month. Representative Smith. On the funding, so we don't know, or this bill doesn't know right now how things are going to be funded, do we? Or where we're getting money to fund. Uh, well, so this bill appropriates funding for the first year, mm -hmm. um, but thereafter, it is not clear. Okay. Thank you. So those are the proposed. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Um, a couple questions I generally in the document. Do you want to comment on these edits? No? Yeah, well, on the question about appropriations, those are for positions. I think those are for two-year positions. So actually, there are permanent positions yeah. and a, a limited, there's one limited service position for the PUC. Yeah. Um, but the it's $825,000 and it's supposed to cover the, the new salaries for those staff, as well as the consultants of which there are three um, and advertising uh, and then any uh, marketing, public outreach, and then any additional operating costs. Um, and so I do think it is based on a one year budget. And good paying jobs. Okay. So I have a couple questions about the on page 11. Uh, where did the 16% come from for each of those categories? Uh, so I'm wondering if Representative Sibelia and Pat may remember. So the S, not S. H715 came out of the, it was a committee bill in, in House Energy last year. And originally there was a discussion about at least a third of the credits should come from low income customers. And then that conversation progressed. And I'm, I think they just landed on, I think just sort of negotiation. I don't know if it's based on any like concrete data uh, but that I'm aware of. Um, so there was a specific work going on around this, um, particularly with Representative Rogers and Representative Brickland. So that would be hmm. the history there. Yeah. There's a history okay. there. Um, and also at the one half for each of these groups, at least one and a half, the credits shall be installed for clean heat measures. That's new this year. Um, and that was proposed by the stakeholder group. Um, and so, so I, I mean, I think there are some reasons for that. I don't know if 50% came from anything specific other than an acknowledgement that there were concern about just the biofuels. Um, uh, and then, oh, sorry. Representative Clifford. Oh, go ahead. Oh, finish what you were doing. Oh, do that. Um, 
on the same page, line 11, with it says, and renter households with tenant paid energy bills. Um, I'm curious about unintended consequences there. Like, what if it, in, it incentivizes landlords to have tenants pay the energy bill? Or, I don't know. I, I'm wondering, renter households with tenant paid energy bills, where that all out came from so there's this concept called the is it called the split incentive where um landlords that own a property that they don't pay the energy bills are on are not incentivized to ever upgrade them or make them more efficient because they don't actually bear the cost of the energy bill um, and so i think there was recognition that when a renter pays utility bill or the, the heating bill, they don't necessarily have direct control over whether or not uh, the property is upgraded. Um, so this is some intent language about acknowledging that renters uh, may face difficulty in getting their landlords to upgrade a building. Representative Logan. Thanks. Um, I worked on the EAN weatherization scale. at scale what team. Um, and one of the policies that we considered as part of that was to authorize tenants to um, you know, seek weatherization without the landlord's permission. Mm. Yeah, I mean, that part I get, but I guess I'm thinking it's sort of like if the landlord's paying the bill, I'll get that the, the idea would be they'd have the ability, but it also could, I mean, incentive, how do you incentivize them to do it on their own? Did you just say that tenants can weatherize without landlord's permission? No. Well, that was part of the proposal from the weatherization at scale team, but that um, legislative proposal has not been. Okay. I don't see why a landlord would refuse it. Right, especially because it would increase the property's value. Absolutely, yeah. <clears throat> Is that a second? Just... You know, if we're looking at the economics of that situation, I think it requires some care because from the, the renter's point of view, you know, all that person really cares about in a strict economic sense is how much it costs them to live there each month and whether they're paying rent or they're paying utilities in a strict sense, like, it doesn't really matter. So I think getting the incentive right is, is tricky because, you know, you know, you can also argue that, you know, a landlord might want to make improvements to their property um, and then when they do lower their energy burden on their tenants, that they then have room to increase the rent. Because again, from a, from a renter's perspective, all that really matters is how much does it cost you each month to live there. So I'm not, I just, I just think it can be very tricky in terms of how we get those, those incentives right, given those, those pieces of the puzzle. Representative Pat. I have a lot of... Uh, past history with, 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 with this issue, and it, it is very, very complicated in terms of uh, some of the things people have said in terms of what, whether you can uh, require somebody to do something to, to their own property. Uh, but the other issue is in a, in a, in a multi, um, uh, you know, multi-dwelling rent, rental situation, um, you, can, you can have a situation where, where um, uh, one tenant decides to go weatherize uh, that would be completely sort of unproductive without doing without doing the whole building, um, and uh, so I, I just I, that the, the the way to get landlords to cooperate is to incentivize land, <laughs> landlords to, to cooperate. Many many do, some don't. Representative Clifford, thank you, Madam Chair. Just wondering, will we be considering any of the changes that the Fuel Dealers Association presented? Um, I'm just curious. We've heard from the proposed changes from the PUC, the Equity Council, and Efficiency Vermont. Yeah. Well, specific. I haven't 
to have a chance to look at any of them. I just wonder if the committee is going to consider them. Yeah, I think that would be if if you want to look at them, I will look at them again too and um, should consider them. Thank you. Uh, I also have another question about the four times for non-compliant, where that number came from. So uh, in the, in S, in H715 as passed last year, the non-compliance was three times um, the amount of the credit cost. Um, and then the Office of Racial Equity re uh, recommended increasing that um, to Senate, to the Senate committees. Um, they did not necessarily provide a specific number. Um, and so um, Senate Natural Resources and Senate Appropriations considered increasing it to a different number and they went, they requested it go to four times. I don't know if there's precedent or anywhere else that we have that kind of penalty. Um, so this penalty structure is not, generally speaking, is not really like other ways. Um, the the PUC's existing penalty structure is pretty. So I'll just step back and say, I don't think uh, there are too many penalty structures like this generally. Can you remind us where this is? Oh, sorry, page 14 at the very top. Slime. I would also just say I haven't actually ever looked at other way at other types of penalties. I don't, I don't, you know, work in judicial issues. So like, I don't know too much about other penalty structures other than out of you know, land. I'm land. checking in with the attorney who does just getting back to us. On this, but. Okay. Um, sure. But I, again, Generally, I don't know that there are too many other systems like this in state government, right? Because like this is a requirement that you do a specific thing by a specific date. Um, so I don't know how many other systems are like that. Well, maybe we first start find out if there's another one that's like it, and if it, if there's a comparable, and if there's not. Representative, Thank you, Madam Chair, for bringing this point up, because I had it circled as well. We did hear from one of the fuel dealers that if for some reason they didn't register on time and they're going to be uh, penalized uh, four times the amount would effectively close up shop for them, that they wouldn't be able to afford it. So that I, I understand the intent. We're, we're trying to incentivize to weatherize and to reduce fossil fuel dependency. Bring, uh, and we've heard different numbers, uh, one out of five uh, fuel dealers that uh, just do installations. And I'm, I'm assuming not all of them would decline to register that they would, but just putting them out of business, at least uh, according to one, uh, one testimony we heard, uh, just that is causing some heartburn. So I would also add that the PUC as the enforcing agency here will have inherent discretion on how they enforce. Um, oh, yeah. And so uh, I think generally with most penalties ass assessed in statute, um, the enforcing agency doesn't necessarily have to uh, assess the full uh, Amount. This shall be. Right. But so the PUC in their enforcement order would have discretion on actually setting that amount. I'm wondering about ability to cure if it's just like two days later or something. Um does cure have a particular legal definition there? Um, I 
do think that the PUC has enforcement discretion in this. Um, if you'd like to reframe it so that it specifies, um, I think, I can't remember if it was in Senate Natural, if it was last year, there was conversation back and forth about whether it should be may or shall to con sort of connote the discretion. But if you'd like it to be more clear that it would be discretionary amount, um, you could rephrase the sentence. Reframe it. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think we're going to take a break till a quarter of, and then we're going to start with our next witness. Thank you, Ellen.